Greetings world and welcome friends from wherever you listen to our podcast. Welcome to another episode of Future Readiness with me, Zah. And you know what we do here. If you're new to the platform, this is where we have conversations with people who are super smart, kind, brave and courageous and who are doing wonderful things in the world of brands, uh, society and just how we might use human-centric creativism to bring humans back to the center of everything we do. Today you're in for a treat, or another treat, I should say, because we were always aiming to just bring you individuals who truly will challenge our minds, help us shift some thinking, and loosen some fixed views about what things are or what things aren't. And today we are in the company of James Leffman. He is with the Liberty um, Institute based at UCT, but I will you will discover for yourself just what a magical human being he is. He does a lot of work in the area of consumer behavior, and he, he is going to get us thinking about changing trends, shifts that are happening in the marketplace, and what brand builders, brand makers, and brand custodians should be thinking about in the unfolding future. So relax, and you're in for another magical 40 to 45-minute conversation with Mr. James. In the bio, we will, we will send a link um, to all the other places where you can find out more about him, including the marketing book that she's just recently published, which has been downloaded over 30,000 times. So all of that and more will be in the bio. But sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Future Readiness. Why, thank you for having me. I feel very grateful to be here. It has been a bit of a journey, uh, but it's been one of those positive ones where it's like we want to see each other. And it's just making a plan to uh, to make that happen. So very yeah. excited to be here. But it's it's also just amazing how, because I was reflecting on on our own journey, right? It just when we met, what were we doing? What were we trying to do? I mean, I remember I had more hair, you had less hair. Now you have more hair, I have less hair. <laughs> less hair. Listen, not much. The armies of the East and the West are all kind of uh, 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 battling to meet each other in the middle. So, <laughs> But what I must say, though, I must say, I did actually meet you, or I, I um, your, your reputation preceded you. Um, I don't know if you remember, you did some work for the Institute many years ago on video uh, yes. for a, a, a video called Marcom. Yes, I remember that. And I show that video many times to my students. I know that video very well. I mean, obviously, it's a little bit dated now, although a yes. lot of the fundamentals are, are still there. Yeah. And, and you were kind of a, a front and center, um, you know, expert in, in commentating on a number of aspects of, 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 of marketing communication. And so I'd, I'd kind of been introduced to you. And then I think you'd also done some, um, you, you, we also interviewed you for our aspiration report, I think. Yes, um, yes. 2017, 2016. Yes. Yes. Um, and so I know we didn't know each other so well then, but I knew you. Oh, my word. But our paths eventually, you know, uh, uh, eventually crossed with, you know, as my work with the Institute crew uh, as well. So I think part, part of what's magical as well is how you meet people at different stages of development, right? Whether it is professional development or personal development or even expertise development. So what is my lane? I've always been this person who comes from a range perspective. So I think Dave, Dave, Dave Epstein speaks about range and how uh, part of what could be problematic is when we just really just force kids, particularly in school, to just be very narrow because it's difficult to diverge when you've just been converging all your life. But before we dive into the big, deep, interesting issues and your mind, which I love and respect, tell people who are new to the magic of James who James is. So we do need to go back there. You, you raised such an interesting point that I love to talk about. But um, yeah, so my name is James Lapperman. I work at the UCT Liberty Institute of Marketing, Strategic Marketing. I've uh, been at UCT for about a decade now, just under a decade. So uh, congrats. Uh, I grew up in Johannesburg. I live in Cape Town now. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I guess over the years, um, you know, the, the, the marketing love that I have and the love for people and, and the desire to understand people kind of have, have converged in kind of a consumer behavior type space where I do a lot of research on on consumers, consumer behavior. Uh, and I just, I love the discipline. Um, I, obviously it, it does have its its, its, its negative sides as well. Um, but uh, I, I do feel like I'm one of the happiest people I know. I've got a, I've got a wonderful job. I work with amazing people um, and it's, it's wonderful to be in education and marketing all at the same time. 
That is so fantastic. I think you've you've given us like so many places to go, right? So there's a conversation around uh, why do you, why why did you fall in love with marketing? Uh, because also you have people who say, do we need the label strategic marketing? Is not is not marketing all strategic? <laughs> what would what did you say to that? So listen, I'm a I'm a language. Uh, I'm I'm the first person to be to be um, critical of the way language is used. And and one of the tricky things we have is you know you and I can have a certain view of a word or a term or the way things should be spoken about. But if you know if industry has a different um, way of viewing that term it becomes a little bit of a wrestle because who are we to necessarily shape the way you know the the the, the market uh, uh, talks about things um but i'm uh, marketing is strategic i agree 100 percent, and i think you know to be honest in the marketing world that wrestle is happening right now i mean if you're yes. on marketing twitter uh, you know you know uh, kind of what's going on um and this whole idea of you know where is marketing's place when it comes to corporate strategy, yes. uh, and we've, we've we, you know, we've, we've looked at that. And, and again, as you look at corporate strategy and as you look at marketing strategy, you're almost talking about the same thing. And yet marketing still has a place in the, the world of communications uh, that it's kind of, it's, 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 it's wrestling with its own identity. I, I, I do believe that. And, and part of what is important, because in our practice, we were very focused on um, future ready leaders, right? So the the our territory is how do we we help future facing leaders build brands of high influence, right? Because those brands do three things. One is they they inspire humans. The second piece is they grow companies, and then the third leg is that they transform society, right? It may feel like a big ask, but I really do feel that until we can get beyond the transactional component. We are just going to be dancing in the transactional space. What what would be your sense of that? Like, where do you think marketing is going, or where it should be going? Where is it? Maybe that's where we should be starting. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think that um, if you have a look, you know, even if and, and and you work with you know with with these companies, and and you know, if you look at at who is at a board level, who is at yes. an executive level, um, you you you've got that space still very much with marketing kind of fighting for a voice, but not really always necessarily being understood. Um, and uh, I heard this about a month ago, and I love it, that the, you know, the MD or the CEO, or whoever's in the top position, they, they are the ones that ultimately need to hold market orientation front and center for their company. But very often those people are trained as accountants, trained as engineers. They don't necessarily have market orientation flowing through their veins. And, and, and that's not to say all of them, you know, but it's, it's not necessarily in their training. And so, you know, marketers, you know, um, at a boardroom level, at an executive level, um, I think actually need to grow in their, well, there are two things. They need to grow in their confidence to be able to say, hey, listen, we can count all the money, that's yeah. fine. But who's there, you know, um, uh, really, um, you know, being the glue between the, 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 the human who is handing over their money and us as the firm who is providing something? Who is, who is facilitating that relationship? It's not the accountants and it's not the IT guys. It's the, you know, it's, it's the marketing function. So, you know, fighting for that narrative. But then on the, on the other hand, I think, you know, marketers need to also then be trained yes. in reading the spreadsheet understanding how finance works, understanding how the economy works. And I think, you know, if, if as a marketer, you aren't, you know, in, in, increasingly training yourself to be able to function at that level, then you mustn't be surprised when you're not being invited in. So I think, you know, it's, it's both. It, it really is both. And that is an interesting thing, because I've always thought of myself as a, as, a, as a person who is in the creative business, right? One is creativity, the other is the business of it. And funny, you should mention... Uh, marketers and boards because do you know I think it was 2019 the last time we did this of the top 50 companies list, listed on the JSE only three of them have marketers on their boards and one marketer sits on all three boards no <laughs> how's that <laughs> so there you go yeah so, so already it says it says to you and I that the overinvestment in accountants may be a good thing because maybe people were still doing the freedman, but you are in business for profit. But we now know that you're in business for many other things besides just profit. So if, if CMOs are not learning the language of business, like you're suggesting reading spreadsheets and preparing Excel spreadsheets, she says, pointing to the self, not a good thing, um, then, then they're not going to be invited into the wider conversations. But so if the reputation now is marketing is an expense, 
How do CMOs move that conversation where marketing can be seen as an investment? What are the things they need to be thinking about? Look, I think I think the um, I mean one of the one of the big challenges for marketers obviously is um, is measurement. You know, how do you measure? what you do mm-hmm. and uh and and you know that that space is growing but th- there is a there is a lot about um the work that gets done in building a brand which companies mm-hmm. want to build their brands that is not easy to measure and yes. the example I, I love to use and it's a little bit of a cheesy one because everyone knows them but you know it's the idea of you know nike will, will will spend tens of millions of dollars putting out an ad that inspires you but it tells you nothing about the product it yes. doesn't tell you about any of its attributes where you can buy it yes. how much it costs i mean it, it literally covers none of those bases yes. and yet you know nike knows that spending that 30 million dollars is good business even though they can't tell you where it comes back or where yeah. it's going to come back and um and that makes marketing very a very hard sell in the boardroom because you know the the, the accountants they want to know we're going to spend x we're going to get y back um and I think one of the, the challenges that, that we as marketers also face is because the, the world of big business mm. is very much driven on like quarterly results, on yes. shareholder value, yes. um, you know, the, the, the way humans work and the way we, we build, um, it, it, it just, we don't work quarter on quarter. I can't yeah. even, you know, I mean, like a quarter is like you just blink an eye. And so it's gone. Then, if we're wanting to help build that mindset, we need to also then convince those around us that building sometimes needs to be slow and steady mm-hmm. and you can't always expect the results at the end of the quarter. And, you know, that is a huge tension with shareholders and, and you know, arguably the system is broken in that regard. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It is, a, it is a difficult one also because you've got reward linked to that, right? So somebody says, here's a campaign, it shoots the last. I mean, for the longest time, everybody was talking about Steve. I remember when I was in the financial services role and that particular environment they all wanted their own steve i'm like you can't have your own steve because the attributes and the credibility that steve has has a lot to do with the distinctiveness of that particular brand so i think part of what we're learning here is ceos unfortunately or some leaders are are, are a lot more comfortable with imitating than innovating and what we need is courage we really need courage in the boardroom we need people who will say Dear Ms. CMO, I don't see what you see, but I trust because you wouldn't necessarily wake up wanting to burn money because you've got time on your hands, right? But how do, how do, I guess the question is how do CMOs get to be taken seriously? How, James? How? Look, I, you know, if I had to be honest, and this is where I need to kind of take a step back, is uh, you must probably need to get some more more C, uh, CMOs who are taken seriously mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and ask them questions. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't presume to speak uh, on the on the on the behalf of of, of mm-hmm. CMOs in the boardroom. So I think mm-hmm. you know the dynamic I'm very aware of, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm very on top of what's going on in the world, and I, I read a tremendous amount, and yes. we've got wonderful relationships with companies across the country, um, international stakeholders, etc. But you know I think you know when it comes to that dynamic, mm. uh, I certainly, I, I certainly wouldn't presume to speak for for, for the CMO community. So uh, that's a tricky one. So look, I, I, I do think that marketing has. Um, uh, I don't think the convincing the convincing part actually, in my mind, comes quite a bit later. I think the mm. marketing is making product X better than product Y. Oh, right. um, and I think, um, and I think that you know that that still is a challenge in South Africa. I mean, I, you know, I won't won't name any brands now, but mm. you know, we work with a number of big companies where you know their their insights and their research departments, you know, are quite honest about the fact that um, you know they they make stuff and then they try and yes. sell it. Uh, yes. And you go and read, you know, Harvard Business Review fifty yes. years ago; they've already started saying, "Stop doing that. Yes. First, figure out what do people want, yes. um, and then try and." you know, create products and services to meet those, those needs. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that, that, that is the heart of marketing. It's a, it's a value exchange. There is someone mm-hmm. who wants to be better. They want their lives to be better. They want um, a certain type of food or a certain type of experience or, you know, they, people want and need things yes. uh, and firms and companies are there to provide that. And I think marketing is all about that exchange. I mean, I think we look, you know, we look at comms um, and, and comms is very powerful, yes. but, you know, for many of us, price is the, you know, is the t- t- determining factor. And I'm horrified to, you know, to see how little training there is 
in understanding the psychology of price. price yes. um, and and yet, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about, hey, cheapest wins, you know, mm. uh, uh, that's that's not the way the world mm. works. But at least understanding understanding price, you know, and, and that falls under the marketing realm. You shouldn't have your accountants setting the price because what they'll do is cost plus 10%, yes. cost plus 30%. And, and, you know, they might be right by, by default, but they might actually be better to say cost plus 60% yes. because we're trying to create um, a brand that is an aspirational brand or, you know, but, but that's a consumer behavior thing or a, yes. a human behavior thing. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get out of trouble before I get <laughs> And, um, uh, and so, yeah, I think, I think that it's, it's, it's about, it's about meeting needs. It's about value propositions. It's about what am I willing to pay and what am I getting in return? Mm -hmm. And those, you know, those are complicated, those are complicated decisions. And it's a, and it's also a very personal relationship, right? Because I, I always say that a brand relationship is like a, a, a personal relationship. It's one, one brand at a time. You may have had a wonderful experience with the builder, builder Bob, and I trust Bob and he lets me down, right? So then it becomes Bob is unreliable, but to you, Bob was reliable. I mean, I remember, um, and I used to use this example often, and I'm happy to have them on record. Woolworths is still the favorite place to buy these small, red, chunky apples, right? And I used to eat those in the cinema back in the days when we could go to cinemas until I bit into one with a rotten core. And I was so disappointed. But because Woolworths had been consistent for so long, I was able to forgive them, right? And that's what happens when a brand is reliable and consistent is in the one moment when it lets you down, you draw back from your emotional deposit and you can forgive and move on. So when you speak about brand relationship, that's the stuff that people are doing. They're going, he was consistent 99% of the time. He let me down once. I'm going back for the 99% because we're not necessarily comparing you with your with your peer, we're comparing you with all other experiences that bring us joy. So when you talk about psychology of price, you actually make me think also about Woolworths because for the longest time, Woolworths was expensive. Expensive was quality, right? I mean, I remember my first job. I think I earned a thousand eight hundred James, and I spent nine hundred of that on a pair of shoes. <laughs> and a friend of mine who was white said to me, I don't understand. You've like literally half of your salary has gone into a pair of shoes. How are you going to see it to the end of the month? And I said to her, H, black people are not poor enough to buy, but black people are not rich enough to buy cheap things. So I've got to buy something that's going to last me for a very long time. But it's also about just the psychology of price. Like if it is, if it was made in Italy, it was supposed to be incredibly exciting. So yeah, there's a lot that, you, but what, I, what else are you finding around price? Because if somebody says, why is everything 49.99 instead of 50 rands? Does it, does it make 49.99 sound cheaper than 50? Look, it's one of those things. We, we're, we're a funny group of people because you'll see that. We'll say, oh, 40, you know, does the one cent make a difference? I can see past it. Uh, and yet, you know, there, there's, a, there's a fair trail of kind of consumer psychology research. I haven't seen anything recently, but certainly, you know, going back a number of years um, where there is, there's, a, there's an anchoring effect that happens that we are um, unconsciously influenced by those kinds of things. And again, you know, uh, one needs to pick up a, a pricing textbook and, and look through that. And, and some of the research you may agree with, some of the, some of it you you won't. But I think in a place in a place like well, in an emerging market, I think one of the, the biggest challenges on price mm. is the assumption that um, people want to buy cheap. Um, and I think you know South Africa is an incredibly aspirational place. Um, the the you know often you see these consumer behavior models, and I always joke about this. I say you know uh, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I was like, listen, Maslow didn't visit South Africa because if he visited South Africa, he wouldn't have drawn such a simple pyramid and 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 sold hundred you know thousands of books or whatever it is. That yeah. that you know consumer behavior here is is um, you know it it does have a nuance to it. But as soon as companies get into this idea that I need to basically um, cut my price in order to get sales, in order to, I mean, that's a, you know, I heard someone say the other day, you know, that's a very quick, quick road to the bottom. I mean, yes. you know, companies just, you know, you end up, no one's making any money. Everyone's looking around, what on earth are we doing here? And I think, um, and I think, you know, that, you know, if I had to say a challenge with price is, mm -hmm. is seeing it in, in a very blunt way. Um, oh, you know, supply and demand curves, drop your yes. price, increase your sales. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, consumer behavior, um, if you, uh, if you had to look um, 
you know, for, for anyone listening, have a look around you, have a look in your house, the decisions that you have made. Some of them you've made absolutely because of price, yes. but others, it's the complete opposite. And to go and, you know, to go and kind of get into price wars, I think is dangerous. I, uh, the, the, you know, make something that people want yes. um, and then sell it at a price that, that, you know, that, that, that makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, that that's a very broad statement, but I'm talking to the entire marketing community. Yes. From yes. selling toilet paper to to to, to cars uh, and and houses, um, uh, you know, understand people, um, understand um, the, the 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 environment, and and yes, during tough economic times, price is massive, mm. absolutely. But it needs to be thought through very carefully. Yes, not just not just you know, uh, put on a put on a percentage and hope for the best. I agree with you that it, it's actually a tactic, not a strategy, because oftentimes people just think this we're going to be the lowest and therefore we'll be fine for the longest time. I mean, I remember uh, there used to be the Edgar's White sale and everybody just waited for the Edgar's White sale. So you actually didn't spend until they could drop their prices. So what are you saying, Mr. James? Are you saying that sales don't work? I'm like, how how are brands supposed to be featuring with sales? Look, I think sales sales can work. They, they can work, I think that, but but uh, as you described, it needs to be a tactic to fulfill a certain role. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, hey, we've got excess stock and we need to get rid of it. And, um, you know, it's not going to be competing with next season's version. Um, you know, let's just drop the price and let's just move the stock. And it, But it becomes a tactical thing. Um, but um, I, I do, uh, uh, to be honest, I mean, um, I, I, I worry about and i would almost argue that i almost wouldn't want to consult to a company that is 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 too willing to play the price game too willing to because then all of a sudden it's like well where's the where's the strategy yeah. if you're just going to be playing a discount game then you just need to worry about your your supply chain your logistics how do you cut costs how do you pay people less yeah. how do you you know spend? like it's just man i actually don't really want to be part of that i want to be part of building something where yes. you're providing value and people don't always want to have the, 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 the cheapest stuff. They want to have stuff that, that makes them feel good, you know? That is true. And so, yeah, I do think, I do think that, um, that one needs to, to understand the, you know, and, and, and yes, I do think uh, discounting and, and, and all of those things can be a tactical uh, move for a certain time. But uh, I would just be very wary if those are the kinds of conversations that are happening um, let's have a sale. Let's drop the price. Let, it's like, whoa, you know, uh, that that's not that's that's not building something. Yes. Uh, if you're going to position your company as we are going to position ourselves as the cheapest, that's different. That's a positioning decision. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are playing in the mid range and you find yourself discounting all the time yes. because you, I, I would just say maybe you need to find another, or you just need to get some some more help. Um, you know, at a strategic level, trying to figure out what is it that you're all about. Yes. And to be honest, if you can't provide value at your price point, then you must probably not, you know, there, there's other things that you're doing wrong. Um, yeah. That is actually true. Because then maybe you should be getting out of the brick business and getting into the cement business. <laughs> keep moving further down the chain. So I, before we started, I was having a conversation with you about how we're, I, here's my view. My view is we're human all of the time and we're consumers some of the time. But why do we still speak about consumer centricity? Like I don't know, because there are, there are parts of me that are not consuming, yet those parts are the parts that speak to my hopes and my fears and my aspirations. Where do those fit in when, when marketers are just consumer centric? So I think, to be honest, I think what, what's happened is that um, the word consumer, I think, becomes shorthand. Um, it becomes shorthand. And, and I, I've had this problem. I'm like, okay, so what word should I use? And, and, and this becomes true when you, um, for example, uh, we, we recently released a textbook. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, now I'm writing this down. What term do I use for people? And, and I mean, here's the thing. So think about it. Think about different terms that are used in our industry, right? So there's the customer, there's the consumer, there's the audience, there's the decision maker, there's the shopper. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, you know, and, 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 you know, in South Africa, you know, just, you would know that yes, in some instances, those are all the same person. Yes. 
But in many instances, those are not the same person. The person who's putting the money down is not necessarily the same as the person who's going to the shop to buy, is not necessarily the same as the person who's going to be consuming. And so yes. it's like, well, what, what term do you use? So, you know, I, I, do, I, do, um, I do think that the idea of, um, and, and this, is a, this is a problem in, 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 in marketing in general, is we become very category focused. And so as a marketer, um, as a brand manager, as a research um, executive, I'm worried about my, you know, financial services, retail banking, how are people banking, or, you know, I'm selling milk, how much milk do people drink? And, and I think those things are necessary to know for your category. But as a consumer behaviorist, I'm like, listen, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to understand about people yeah. first. And then you can build your understanding of how they interact with your category. And I think without that understanding, that human understanding, I do think that the decision making becomes limited. So I think that I think that that, that foundation of understand the human, understand people, their lives, um, you know, and, and, and multiple components thereof um, becomes a foundation and 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 yet what what happens is often there's there's not enough time for that it's not seen necessarily always as a good investment um or or you know people are overworked and they're you know they've just got the boss telling them listen tell yes. me the market share for you know our, our our product and 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 you know that that becomes their job it's very again it's very it's very much about the category yes. um but when it comes to long-term strategy um you need to understand for for most consumables um, you know, there's there's a there's a um, there's a, a lot of trade offs that are happening, um, and that's within the basket. And and um, and so yeah, I think you know you you would you would do well to try and understand people first before you understand your category. I could high five you right now because yes, 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 yes. No, because you know this it's refreshing because I think part of what we're seeing is the evolution of language, right? And you've got the the and we're going to use the account and CEO as a holding pattern. Please forgive us, we're not being unkind, but this is a reference we're familiar with. That when we finally can have the CEO understand the importance of the consumer, that you're not just designing things for their own sake. If we're making mattresses, we're making mattresses for people. So let's start focusing on what that is. I guess the role of the marketer then in the organization is to become this consumer and human ambassador, like drive the conversation. But you can't drive the conversation if you don't understand what the pain points for accounting, for sales, for all those other things. So you almost have to go everywhere in the business and then make certain that everyone understands why marketing is such a key role in the in the lockdown james we saw people turn the taps off with marketing spend right uh, what how do you how do you encourage leaders to stay visible engaged and investing in their brands even when they think there's no one who's buying because nobody's going to the shops you know because a, a two-year a two-year blackout is a long time in the world of brand building it is. It is. Look, I mean, I, I definitely, um, you know, there, there, there is some good thinking on it, and and hopefully we're at the tail tail end of things. But you know, one of the one of the things that always always fascinates me is, and and again, it it, it comes down to the short termism, is, and and you the investment world even knows this. Yeah. When do you buy? You buy when you know there's opportunity for growth. Yes. You know, um, when a, a share has reached some form of kind of plateau. Um, you know that's that's where you sell. It's it's valuable, but the the room for growth feels like it's 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 you know it's it's reached some some sort of ceiling, and I think you know during tough times, your strong brands and especially your brands that actually have money in the bank, should be using that as an opportunity to to eat market share yes. out of your competitors. I yeah. mean, it, it, and and I understand you know needing to be careful and 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 all of those things, but that's where I think long term versus short termism mm -hmm. uh, uh, comes into play. You know, if 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 you've got a brand, it's strong already. Um, you realize that your competitors are weak. I would be overspending yes. um, in order to um, have a position when the you know when the pie starts to grow again. You know, your your ten percent is now fifteen yes. percent. I mean, as the pie grows, I'd be like, man, you know, high fives all around, like work well. But but that that happens by by taking risks. Yes. Um, so yeah, I do think that um, I do think that that that's um, that's a part of it, and and that's where temperament comes in. You know, sometimes we can be risk averse and to feel like, man, I don't want to be the one that blew the budget for nothing. Um, and so uh, let's just you know let's just all 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 stand back and. Uh, and to be honest, the ones that really get ahead are the ones that are willing to take those risks. Um, yeah. 
That is that is that is also very true because in the we remember the people who stick with us when the going is tough. And we do it with friends. We also do it with brands, right? So when there's nothing going on in the marketplace and you're out there just trying to sell us some form of joy, when the when the good times come back, I'm going to remember that you were alongside me trying to sell me some some form of joy. So yeah, um, but I, I I do understand that it becomes a balancing act because it's about prioritization, right? But if marketing is not seen as a strategic component for sustainable growth, that's when you turn the lights off because you think you can you can do without it. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I mean, two things. The one is, is again, going back, it's been a tough couple of years. And I do think that um, a lot of people have just been doing the best that they can with, you know, with high levels of uncertainty. Um, and so, you know, to be honest, anyone who's kind of survived and done okay over the last few years, you know, you do deserve a good, good pat on, good pat on the back because, because not everyone has made it, made it through un, unscathed. Uh, but just going back, back a little bit, and, and this might, this might, I'm, I'm going to send a little challenge back your way. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the challenges that, that I think we also have, so, you know, you spoke about, about, you know, you know, being human. Yes. And a lot of the a lot of the language around the way things should be um, can be difficult to translate into the boardroom, and so you know uh, um, you know uh, account executives needing to make you know decisions. They want to know how many people are consuming our product. Like it's a consumption thing. It's not about the human. It's not about the bigger picture. And sometimes I think the way that we present um, the way that we present an expanded view of yes. marketing, it comes across, it, it, it's, it's not done in a way that, um, that I think um, buys credibility. And, and I, I struggle a little bit, I, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff around purpose um, mm. and, and all of those things. And, 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 and I think all of those things are, are crucial, but how that's communicated in the boardroom is very different than when you're speaking to the choir of peers. Yes. Um, and I think as marketers that, you know, that is something we need to wrestle with a little bit is in the way that we communicate certain things. Um, are we able to, to buy credibility with those who don't necessarily understand it? Um, and that, you know, that, 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 that's a tricky one. You know, I don't, I definitely don't have all the answers, but I do know that, that marketing has suffered, um, you know, over the years. Um, from um, appropriation of the term marketing, you know, mm, yeah. it's digital marketing, it's purpose marketing, it's performance marketing, it's, it's marketing. It's like, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, no wonder we don't have credibility because we come up with a new form of marketing every week to present to the, to, you know, to, to, to the board. And I think, yes. um, I think that, that, um, yeah, there, there, there's a, um, there's a power in communication and choosing words and also choosing timing. You know, sometimes um, it can be the right idea, but it's just not the right time for the board to hear it. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is something there. And I, again, I don't have all the answers, but I do think that we need to be careful with, with and I guess it's, 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 it's been careful not to um, give the feel that it's a buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I think that that's difficult. That is difficult. And, and also that it shouldn't sound very kumbaya-ish, right? Because sometimes when you, when you start to speak of humans, everybody goes, oh, kumbaya, no, 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 that's not what it is. So how do we bring it down to the level of your understanding? Because I guess that is the, the definition of effective comms, right? Is speaking so that your message is understood, not speaking so you demonstrate how much you know, because that's the thing, right? It is in that understand the context understand the language in that context and therefore and it's not about watering anything down it's just about adjusting your stance to ensure success big time and 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 to be honest because a lot of you know uh, as you described with your your stats on on you know our top 50 companies or what have you yes. um you know a lot of it is then leading up yes and that is a that is a that is a very um a unique and learnable skill um, but you need to understand what you're doing. You need to understand yes. that you are trying to lead up. Um, yes. and, and that is, that is different than leading down or leading sideways. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of it has to do with your own, I guess, your own personal capital, right? In that environment, what else have you done to earn credibility? Um, and it could be, if you're a marketer listening, it may not even have to do with a campaign. It just may have to do with something you picked up on the weekend about a competitor who's expanding their production to China and you and bringing that to the decision makers to demonstrate that your investment as a as a marketer is beyond just your marketing role so it's these small things that we can do just to show that we are invested in the whole business not in the business of creating campaigns 
Big time, big time. And and I mean, you mentioned such a nice point there, and I, and I would I would I want to jump on that with two hands because I think, uh, to be honest, I haven't seen a lot of really great competitor analyses. And if you want to bring something into the boardroom or into the at an executive level to get people's attention, the marketing department should be able to say, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's what everyone else is doing. Yes. Here's what we can learn from it. I mean, that gets my attention. Yes. Because you are showing an understanding of the market. And, yes. and that's like that's a marketing role. It's a little bit I I I get sad when um and, and any agency people might be upset to hear me. I get sad when marketers outsource their segmentation to an agency. Yes. I'm like, you should be knowing your consumer or your human or, you know, this is your, this is your domain. You should be understanding who it is that, that buys your, your products or services or who's loyal to you. And, and, and yes, your, your agency can help you, you know, um, uh, in, in, in a certain extent, but this idea of like, okay, we need a segmentation strategy. Here's a, you know, an agency needs to come up with, it's like, whoa, there's just this huge disconnect between what marketing should be doing. And, yes. and it's the same with a competitor analysis, like marketing, I would try and own that space, use that as a, a tool to get you heard at high levels, because if you can show an understanding of what's happening in the market, mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's, there's little cues. I mean, if you're on top of what's happening in annual reports and um, what kind of campaigns are being launched yes. I mean, you'll have a view of what's happening in the market at a product level at a comms level at a pricing level you know those are all things that you bring to the boardroom that gets everyone's attention yes um, and i think that that's an easy win um that is an easy win and i've always said i mean i inherited once a, a marketing department and i took the time to sit with everyone and just ask them why they were in marketing and maybe 25 percent of them said to me they were in marketing because they were waiting for the jobs that they really wanted in other divisions do you know how heartbreaking that was for me <laughs> because <laughs> yes i converted them externally <laughs> because i think if you really really want to to have great success in marketing you have to stay curious human nature must be an ongoing social sociological undertaking for you like you truly truly have to be curious about just how humans are and how humans function because we're not we're not rational you know we'd love to think that we're rational but actually we're not we're just we're just a bung, a bungle of contradictions so t you you are talking about ad agencies and their relationship with marketers. Um, I remember uh, when I first started out in the game and the one person I was looking to who was a strategic director at the time said, it's the marketing department's responsibility to bring us their understanding of the consumer. Our job is to serve them with insights that will increase their success in the marketplace. But first, bring me your understanding. So I, you and I agree. Um, and I don't know if other people will be upset. I'm hoping that they will be uplifted and refreshed by a positioning that says, marketing, don't outsource. It's like giving away your secret sauce. Like that, the secret sauce should be the thing that you understand. It's like admitting that you don't have a secret source. Actually, yes, yes. Um, it's it's. But and and again, this isn't. This is um. This is actually a credit to agencies. Yes. That they'd be like, man, the market is not doing their own work. Yeah. Well, let, you know, we can build some hours for this. Um. And, and and again, many of them do a great a great job. And 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 you know, it's not a criticism over the work. I think it's a, it's a it's an indictment on the marketing function. Yes. Um. Um. More than it is anything else. Yeah. Oh, but uh, I mean, now you've got uh, management consulting practices now leaning over into the creative services. So this pie is just get, this, the competition is getting more and more intense. But I'm now interested in the work that you've been doing in the consumer behavioral space. Like, what are you finding that's new, surprising, concerning? Like, what are, what are, the, what are the things that you're finding? So, I mean, a couple of things. I think that um, obviously uh, the last two years and COVID was a, a real kind of, you know, um, obviously it was, a, it, it was an adjustment. And to be honest, we've put a lot of our big projects on hold mm -hmm. and purely um, to provide a window, um, you know, from our institute into kind of the world of um, what's happened the last two years with consumers. Yes. Uh, at a macro level, predominantly, uh, but also just, you know, there, there's a lot of agencies, there's a lot of articles that you can read and research reports on COVID, COVID, COVID. Yes. And we were like, look, you know, what? we don't just want to kind of jump in and be another um, a, another one of those. So we've, we've kind of held back a little bit. Um, and now we're, you know, we're starting to, to, to kind of look ahead at, okay, so what are, you know, what are some of the, 
um, you know, the big segments in South Africa that have gone through adjustments. And uh, we're looking we're looking at the middle class this year, mm-hmm. which the you know the institute has done a, a number of studies over the last two decades on the middle yes. class. Um, and one of the things that, that that really is most exciting about it is, um, you know, if you had to go back 15 years, um, there'd be a middle class study, a black middle class study, yeah. and all of a sudden you'd have this you know this hall filled with white marketers who yeah. want to hear about the black middle class yes. because you know the, wow this is this brand new this brand new consumer a segment um and and um and i think that that one of the most encouraging things that that really has happened over the last 15 20 years is that you know that that landscape has, has been shifting and it's it's shifting too slowly 100% but it's been shifting where i think the um the narrative around the middle class 15 years ago is not the same as it is today um, and and we're excited excited to share some of those things uh, uh, in our in our report at the end of the year. So I'm not going to so. give I'm not going to give anything uh, uh, anything away. Uh, but I mean I, I will give you an example. Um, is um, you know the 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 narrative, for example, around the black middle class 15 years ago, it was it was about aspiration. It was yeah. about moving out of poverty into the middle class, and and um, it was about asset catch up, and 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 there was a number of a number of uh, of kind of narratives that that that, that came out. Um, but what we're going to be seeing over the next, you know, two decades is really the first big migration of, um, middle-class households into retirement. Mm -hmm. And if you think of South Africa, like the entire retirement, formal retirement industry has been built over hundreds of years around white people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, it's Mm -hmm. retirement homes out in the vineyards. Yes. Yes. Retirement policies that you basically needed a stable job for a hundred years and all yes. you know and and you know and and it's just that's just not the way that South Africa yes. is yes. Um, and yet you know uh, many of many of um, you know financial services they they understand that but but it's 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 an adjustment that they're finding difficult to to, to make and I think that's so exciting from a consumer yes. behavior point of view you know just what we're going to be seeing over the next two decades yes. is, is literally unprecedented in this country yes you know? yeah. Um, that that is that's so fantastic because it reminds me of an ad that Droga Five did on Prudential, uh, speaking to how you then go beyond the transaction because the the many bank relationships end with have you invested enough for your retirement? Here's here we'll pay you every month goodbye. But what Prudential did actually they ran a campaign on day one, right? I've now retired. This is the first day where I don't have to go anywhere. What does that feel like for me? Because my identity was locked with work. It was locked with provision, with performance, with authority and stature. Who am I when I don't have the CEO title? So I think part of what, and I'm hoping that what we will see are brands that are challenging themselves to think beyond the comfortable. To say, okay, if this landscape is changing, Um, If in a community of black consumers where retirement doesn't mean I'm going into a village, but I'm just going to stay in the house where I raised my seven children, what does that mean? You know, um, how do I how do I make use of the money that I've saved over time? What does it mean for old age homes? Right. Because old age home moving my mother into an old age home would be an indictment. Like my whole street, her whole community would come to me and then say, you're throwing your mother away. She raised you. How dare you go and throw her away? I mean, so all of these are conversations that I guess the, the, if we use the black middle class as the, almost the lighthouse, then the conversations have to be led by those who are identified as the black middle class. How do you go back home to bring your mother into the current era, right? And and do it with respect. But also how do you how do you how do you do that? Because there's always going to be the tension between modernization and cultural dictates. And and cultural dictates does not in any way suggest that we are backwards. It just means this is a way of life that has brought us this far. And what are the things that we need to be chess? I'm, I'm very interested to read your study. See now I'm, I'm by chomping at the pits now. No, look and, and again I think I think what you know what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking a little bit about that, but I think it's almost preempting the next, you know, the next, you know, a decade or two's worth of research looking ahead because mm-hmm. you know we you know we might have an idea of how things will play out um uh, and even people themselves might have an idea if you ask someone who's um you know a few years away from retirement what they want yes. um but how that will actually play out um you know uh, uh, that that's going to be interesting to see and the definition of retirement because people always say to me 
are you ready for? I'm like, what do you mean retirement? Like, let me tell you, retire for me is R E T Y R E. Literally, get new threads on my tires and just keep it going. Just keep it going. Have you seen any piece of work that's moved you lately? Like, have you seen any marketing campaigns that have got you thinking, okay, South Africa, we, we're still kicking some dust. I mean, I, I was trying to keep up with what's going on at Cannes at the moment, and several campaigns have won, and it's good because South Africa has, oh, we've always done well on those global creative platforms. But awards don't necessarily translate into results, which which takes us back to the earlier conversation about how do you convince uh, decision makers or purse holders in the business that they should be investing more. Have you seen any campaign that's moved you lately? Um, to, to be honest, I haven't. I'm not. I'm not on on top enough of, of what's 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 been going on. Um, and I do. Um, I must say, I'm a I'm a huge fan of um, the creative industry and what they're able to uh, what they're able to do. Um, what I do, uh, you know, I, I do think coming out of, out of Can and and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the, the talks when they they posted. I I, I know um, not all of them have, have been posted yet. Yes. And and I I myself didn't attend. Um, but is is you know that 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 tension between um you know um awards between what's topical what's trending and then what's the reality in the market um yes. and so you know i you know i myself i'm i'm, I'm certainly not a, a an expert you know when it comes to to comms and creativity and and, and the work that agency do I'm, I'm a fan of it but i'm not an expert in it um but i do think that that one of the one of the tensions that that i feel is the idea of we need to say something and we need to say something new and something fresh. But as a consumer behaviorist, I know that people don't change that quickly, you know, and, and even in our own work, mm -hmm. we're like, okay, so what really has changed in the last three years at a consumer behavior level? And, and I'm talking about outside of COVID and you can say, well, look, you know, three years goes very quickly. I mean, three years ago is 2019. I mean, I feel like, man, 2019, that, that was literally yesterday. Um, and yet you'll see a lot of these kind of trend decks about, oh, everyone's going to be using virtual reality and, you know, and, and the metaverse and, and, you know, we're going to be using voice to do 80% of our purchases. And, and I'm like, do you even get out? Do you know what people do? Like, you know, there, there's this kind of technocrat kind of level of um, trend expert that I, I do think we need to be careful not to be too influenced by. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I always encourage, encourage is, is know your category, know your consumer, mm -hmm. understand what trends are happening, build towards the future. I understand that, but don't get too carried away by a charismatic, um, you know, marketing <laughs> guru, uh, because, and, and I, I use Twitter as a nice example. You know, if I open Twitter one day and, and I listen to, to all sides, so I'm not, I'm trying not to just listen to the choir here and I'll see marketing guru a, who maybe, you know, and I'll see what they say and I'll be like, they're right. And, you know, and, and, and the world is changing and tomorrow's just, and, the, and, and I'll be like, I don't know. Another. And then, you know, the next day I open, you know, the, the anti person, uh, and they're like, listen, you know, don't get to, and I'm like, they're right. And it's almost like whoever I saw first, you know, gets first, you know, first dibs on, on, on my, on my, on my brain for the day. Uh, and I think I've, I've, I've had to learn just to dial it back and to say, okay, what do I actually know about, you know, consumer behavior in my category? And what do I, you know, what, what does the past tell me about adoption? Um, and, you know, virtual reality, I remember in, in primary school, buying computer game magazines and reading about virtual reality and being wowed by it. And here we are 30 years later, the technology is amazing. But how much do I use in my everyday life? Not zero. And I've got a little virtual reality goggles. It was amazing for the first week and I'll just sit on my shelf. Um, and so I understand the possibilities, but there's also a reality in the fact that, you know, for many brands, those possibilities aren't going to translate even in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And so just to manage one's expectations a little bit. So I can't remember where I got on this high horse. of No, 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 no. You were, we were speaking about awards and how all of these things ladder up or they don't. And you make a valid point, which is this idea that um, uh, possibility or potential and its relationship to performance, because that, that should be an ongoing conversation. So I agree with you completely about that. I went to the um, uh, Festival of Marketing in the UK and listening to listening to Mark Ritson and Byron Sharp sit is exactly that. 
<laughs> it's exactly that because you're going, I agree with Mark. I agree with Bar. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to make my own view when I get home on that long flight. But yeah, yeah, it is. It's always a balancing act. Now, tell before I let you go, tell me why you felt there was room and a need for another book on marketing, and and what did you want to solve? What need were you specifically addressing? So, uh, very simple needs, which hopefully is is a mantra that a lot of a lot of marketers uh, uh, they don't try and overcomplicate things. Um, the one is the need for South African textbooks. So there are a number of South African textbooks, absolutely, but there's still a little bit of a sense that we take what's American and we adapt it for South Africa. Um, and I think that that um, you know for certain marketing principles, one can 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 do that. But there's certain aspects of marketing um, that I do think we need to be able to kind of have a ground up approach, especially things like consumer behavior. Yes. Um, and so that was that was playing in my mind. And to be honest, the biggest one was um, a lot of my students would come to me and they'd say, you know, uh, uh, um, the textbook is 800 Rand. Do I need it? And it would be hard for me to say no, because I feel like, man, you're here to get an education. You need the textbook. But also, if I say yes, I knew that, you know, the, the textbook's 800 Rand. It's got, you know, um, 700 pages, and we're most probably going to get through 200 in an introductory course. Um, and so, you know, and, and in South Africa, a lot of our students struggle financially. They need to be making trade-offs, mm -hmm. and it become a bit of a tension for me, you know, to, to you know, I can't say no, but I also struggle to say yes. And so what I wanted to do, and we've got some, some friends from, from industry, from marketing, even students themselves, uh, we all chipped our time in together. Um, the, the institute put in money, UCT put in money, UCT library um, um, agreed to host it. And we actually said, you know, the big thing here is we're going to make it open source that, um, you know, anyone can, can download it for free. Um, and it becomes a quality textbook that, that at least for introductory marketing, that can at least cover cover your bases. And it's, it's been very well received. We've been very encouraged. I mean, we got uh, it re launched last year, January. Uh, we've had over 70,000 downloads. Yes. Uh, from 130 countries. That and I mean, amazing. I was like, I had on my wish list, I had an impossible prayer list um, at the beginning of the year it was to get to 10,000 by December. Whoa. And and I mean, we'd, we'd got that, I think we'd got that within the first two months or the first three months. I was like, what my on mind. earth is going on? Um, and that was, this was, believe it or not, before even my own students were using it. So this is before we'd even prescribed it at UCT. So um, very encouraged um, and looking to to build on that, obviously for for the future. So um, you know the, the the main the main reason was actually to to try and help my students not to have that tension around do I need to buy a marketing one textbook or, or, or isn't that isn't that a fantastic thing because you looked at them as humans, not as consumers of your knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> so what I must say, what I must say, one of the students, and I kid you not, one of the students came to me and said, um, uh, um, "Do I need to buy the textbook?" because I would rather use the money on makeup. <gasps> and I thought, you know, the, the range of people who don't want to spend money on textbooks goes all the way from those who would rather spend their money on makeup all the way to those who don't, you know, uh, who, who can't afford, can't afford the high textbook prices. And so I was like, listen, humans come in all shapes and sizes <laughs> and what drives our behavior comes in all different forms. So uh, That is so incredible. I mean, I think, I think that particular student was showing once more that uh, I guess the tension between my need state and my and my development state, right? So it's like, where am I and what do I need? So if if I'm if I have a YouTube channel, maybe my makeup will get me more followers <laughs> rather than a do one. Wow, that is so interesting, James. It has been an absolute absolute delight. Like I am so glad that we finally got to speak, and I I really will encourage people to. Look, we'll send, we'll have the, the links in the bio um, at the bottom of this video clip when we post it. But please just engage with the work of the Institute because it's, it's, it's longer than and deeper than some of the things that James and I were able to talk about on this call. And just, um, I guess, uh, the desire for me would be to get to a place where marketing becomes a crucial seat at the table. Because if we are not in the room, it means the people we serve are also not in the room. And then what's the point of being in business, right? What's the point of being in business? From now on, Full Circle will be called Future Readiness with Zah. And we'll still have those thoughts, expanding conversations and the streams of encouragement that you enjoy. If you already subscribed to Full Circle with Zah, you are automatically subscribed to Future Readiness with Zah. And you can continue to listen to all the conversations 
on the podcast platform of your choice. But also let me know if there are any specific topics or guests you would like us to host. Enjoy, like, and share. And until the very next time, I wish you clarity and courage.